Welcome to Move the Memos, a truth out podcast about things you should know if you want to change the world. I'm your host, Kelly Hayes. When people in the U.S. object to the bombardment of Gaza and the apartheid policies imposed on Palestinians by the Israeli government, they are often met with the deflection that it's complicated. We also hear talk of Israeli self-defense in spite of the phenomenally disproportionate scale of the violence we are witnessing. For years, supporters of Palestine in the U.S. have faced false charges of anti-Semitism, as well as stark professional consequences, and a widespread unwillingness to engage with the topic from people who dismiss the violence as too complex or entrenched to comprehend or impact. But in this terrible moment, as Israeli bombs once again rain on Gaza, and Israeli mobs, escorted by Israeli police, violently force Palestinians from their homes en masse in order to steal and occupy their land, solidarity for Palestine is rising. Tens of thousands of people in the United States have taken to the streets in recent days as a moment of global protest against Israel's bombardment of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip continues to unfold. A rift has cemented around the crisis in the Democratic Party, with some members urging President Biden to condemn Israel's attacks on Gaza. On Sunday, the United States once again blocked a joint UN statement calling for an immediate ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. And on Monday, word broke that the Biden administration had approved the sale of $735 million in precision-guided weapons to Israel even as Israeli attacks on Palestinian hospitals, press offices, homes, and schools operating as bomb shelters continued. Over the weekend, an Israeli airstrike at a Palestinian refugee camp killed at least 10 people, including eight children. As of this recording, over 200 Palestinians, including 61 children, have been killed by Israel's ongoing aerial assaults, while 10 Israelis have reportedly been killed by Hamas rocket fire. While a great deal has been made of the need for Israel to defend itself, it would be intellectually dishonest to characterize Israel's military posture as one grounded in self-defense. In a 2018 speech, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu stated, quote, In the Middle East and in many parts of the world, there is a simple truth. There is no place for the weak. The weak crumble, are slaughtered, and are erased from history, while the strong, for good or for ill, survive. The strong are respected, and alliances are made with the strong, and in the end, peace is made with the strong. End quote. Morally speaking, this situation is not complex. But the U.S. media and education system have spent decades minimizing or completely erasing the truth about Israeli aggression and the Palestinian struggle for self-determination and survival. I have gotten a number of requests from friends and listeners for an episode of Movement Memos that would help break down some of the history and dynamics that they haven't been exposed to over the years. Even many of us who are supportive have a lot to learn. So in this episode, I talk with Palestinian activist Leah Kayali about some of the history and politics at work in this situation. This conversation is geared towards people who are new to the topic, but I hope that everyone will find it as enriching as I did. Today's guest is Leah Kayali. Leah is a Palestinian community activist, writer, and digital organizer. She is also a Truth Out contributor, and you can find her most recent piece, My Grandparents Lived Through the Nakba, Now It's Happening Again, on our website at truthout.org. Leah Kayali, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing today? Well, you know, um, I'm actually feeling somewhat energized today. It's been a really heavy week, but uh, here, you know, I live in Boston, and we, we had, you know, at least over a thousand, probably thousands of people come out to our protest yesterday. And so that was really energizing for me after, after a tough week. So I'm, I'm hopeful, cautiously optimistic. <laughs> it really has been amazing to watch these protests unfold. And I'm so grateful you could make the time to be here amid everything that's happening. 
people in the U.S. rarely have a clear picture of what's happening in Gaza. So just to frame the urgency of the moment a bit, can you tell us a bit about what's happening on the ground in Gaza and elsewhere in Palestine and Israel right now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'll I'll start by saying, like, to be real, this is merely a continuation of the ethnic cleansing and the violence that was started 73 years ago in Palestine. But um, this this most recent, you know, incursion of of Zionist violence, I would say, uh, sort of began around the planned dispossession of Sheikh Jarrah. And Sheikh Jarrah is a Palestinian neighborhood in Jerusalem. Um, And so this was, you know, part of the Israeli plan to rid Jerusalem of its of its indigenous Palestinian population to sort of claim that city uh, as as wholly Israeli. And Sheikh Jarrah villagers were committed to defending their homes, you know, bringing international attention to their cause and resisting their their active dispossession. And so this was, you know, happening over the last few weeks. Settlers were attacking villagers taunting them during Ramadan, during our iftar, which is the breakfast um, of Ramadan. Settlers would invade the, the village and throw things um, to, to indignify Palestinians there. And that escalated eventually to the military coming in to, to protect and um, reinforce those uh, Zionist settlers by, you know, doing things like dowsing Palestinian homes in skunk water so bad that I've, I've been told you can smell the homes from blocks away, you know, then they also were firing rubber bullets. Uh, one of the, you know, at least on one occasion, settlers fired live bullets into a crowd of peaceful protesters in Sheikh Jarrah. And also, like, something I, I always want to clarify is that rubber bullets in, in Palestine, are they're not, like, you know, Nerf bullets. Like, these are rubber-coated steel bullets that do real damage. Um, and, you know, the same thing happened during the brutal attacks on Al-Aqsa in, in Jerusalem during the Most Holy Night of Ramadan, Lila al-Qadr, and, you know, there were also attacks on Palestinian Christians observing Orthodox Easter uh, in the last weeks. And, you know, I think it's important to understand that that these preceding incidents, you know, for Palestinians of faith, this is like the most egregious indignation that we could possibly imagine. Um, you know, I, I, re- I remember uh, when, when I visited and prayed in Al-Aqsa three to four years ago when I was in Palestine, I mean, it's, it's a, a very sacred spot. It's the most holy site for Muslims in Palestine. And it was like a a refuge in a city swarmed by militarized Israeli police occupation. So to have the military and Israeli settlers storm that compound and brutalize worshipers, fire rubber bullets into the crowd of worshipers, I mean, it's it's unspeakable. And I want to reiterate something that I heard from a friend's cousin uh, in the aftermath of the attacks on Al-Aqsa, which is that, you know, um, her, her father was praying in Al-Aqsa and when, when the attack started and he's a doctor, so he immediately ran, you know, to the medical unit on the compound. And um, as he was treating the wounded, the medical compound came under fire and he was actually injured by a, um, you know, a rubber bullet and was unable to, to continue to help people. So, you know, these, this is, you know, preceding the attacks on Gaza. So Palestinians have been facing just astounding levels of violence and dehumanization um, the attacks on the home defenders of Sheikh Jarrah, the assault on Al-Aqsa, and now the bombardment of Gaza. And, you know, last last I had seen, Israeli forces had launched, I think, like over a thousand air and artillery bombs that have now killed, you know, I think almost 200 people. And uh, over 50 of those who have been martyred um, are children, you know? So like as, as a Palestinian watching this happen, you know, seeing the headlines, scroll through. I mean, we've all, I think Palestinians all around the world have been in a constant state of doom scrolling for the last couple of weeks. And it's like, we want to hold every, every martyr's name and every, every person's story, but the headlines and the messages are just coming in, you know, faster than we can read them. I would, I do want to uplift the story of Rama Saad, who's a Palestinian journalist in Gaza, who, you know, she was killed with her five-year-old son and her husband in an Israeli airstrike. You know, they, they were, these people are not a security threat. The whole families have been wiped out. Like the 16 members of the al family are not a security threat. So, you know, this is, um, sorry for going on, but this is this is the reality for people in Gaza right now. They have nowhere to run, you know? Um, like you know, there was a recent attack on uh, an international 
new, like a, a multi-story building that hosted international news outlets. Like that's not a security threat. That's a PR threat to the Israeli state. So, you know, this is what's happening in Gaza. And, and you know, another thing I'll just say is like, I, I'm getting personal, you know, news from folks on the ground that families are sleeping in the same room so that if they, if they're bombed, they'll die together. And, you know, really for families in Gaza, like, like I said, there's nowhere to run and, and all they have is luck. So the, the urgency could not be more severe right now in Palestine. Well, thank you for that explanation. And I also appreciate you emphasizing that rubber tip bullets are in fact made of steel, because I think it's a problem that we see a lot here in the U.S. that people accept these so-called non-lethal weapons as innocuous because of the names they're given. But while those names may soften the PR impacts of those weapons, they do not soften the physical impacts that people experience when they're attacked. Skunk water, for example, sounds almost cartoonish, but it is not a harmless substance. For our listeners who may be unfamiliar, skunk water was first used by the Israeli military against protesters in the occupied West Bank in 2008. The smell has often been compared to a combination of sewage and rotting flesh. It's deployed in handheld canisters and fired from guns and also from water cannons on armored vehicles, sometimes against crowds at protests and sometimes dousing businesses and entire neighborhoods as a form of collective punishment. The resulting smell can linger for weeks. Josh Briner wrote in 2017 that, quote, Skunk is liable to cause physical harm, such as intense nausea, vomiting, and skin rashes, in addition to any injury resulting from the powerful force of the spray. Examinations by police and army medical teams in the past also indicated that the excessive coughing caused by exposure can result in suffocation, end quote. So I want people to be mindful when they hear these terms that we are talking about weapons that inflict immense suffering and that they are deployed with that intention. But circling back, May 15th marked the 73rd anniversary of the Nakba, when Zionist militias drove 750,000 Palestinians from their homes. In your Peace and Truth Out, you talked about how your grandparents were among those displaced. Can you tell us a bit about those catastrophic events in 1947 and 1948, and how your family and grandparents were impacted? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I want to start by just appreciating how you said 1947 and 1948, because I think one of the biggest successes of, of messaging propaganda around the Nakba is to present, you know, the quote unquote violence as a reaction to the creation of the Zionist state, which is, you know, not not the reality at all. The reality is that this was premeditated ethnic cleansing of non-Jewish Palestinians from their homelands in order to make room for for Jewish settlers. And this started, you know, as early as the partition in November of 1947, where basically a bunch of Europeans um, in, in Britain, particularly, drew lines on a map to dispossess hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and, and so, you know, in the ongoing Zionist militant violence that was the carrying out of that of that plan, over 500 villages were wiped off the map. There were more than 50 massacres, I think around 70 massacres that have been documented. So, you know, there were 750,000 Palestinians dispossessed, but there were 15,000 Palestinians murdered, you know? And so perhaps like one of the, one of the most infamous of these massacres was the Der Yassin massacre, which happened uh, in April of, of 1948. That, and that's where, you know, some 200 villagers were subjected to, to rape and torture before being essentially paraded around town and gunned down. Um, and that's that's a story that every Palestinian I know carries. And the, the psychological element of the Nakba is also so important to understand because the survivors of these massacres were then you know, sent away from, from their desecrated homes to carry the message to the other villages that you know, you're next. Uh, I've heard stories of, of loudspeakers that were paraded through villages that were blasting sounds of of you know cries of Palestinians escaping violence, essentially again to send that message like this will happen if you don't leave. And and I grew up with these stories. You know my family uh, fled by boat and by foot and bus from Yaffa, Palestine, under fire to Gaza, and it was it was horrific. I mean they they had been hearing for weeks. You know you're next, you're next, and then finally uh, Zionist militants you know 
rolled through town um, and, uh, you know, displayed unconscionable violence against villagers and people fled by boat um, because for, for most people, that was the only way to go. Yaffa is, is on the coast of Palestine. So, uh, you know, in my family, I'm particularly thinking about my grandmother's story. You know, my grandmother was the oldest of three very small children at the time, including one baby, my, my great uncle. Um, and my, my great grandmother in Shiraz became so ill during this, you know, their, their exodus that she couldn't nurse her baby, my great uncle, um, Said. And so, you know, after they had fled Yaffa and were, were, you know, among the refugees in Gaza at the time, they were trying desperately to find other new mothers that, you know, among the refugees that could nurse him. And, uh, you know, eventually he actually died of, of malnourishment. And my great grandfather also died of the stress of the catastrophe just months after he was finally able to resettle his family in Lebanon. My grandfather also died young. So, so the Nakba, you know, even just the initial 1947-1948 Nakba is actually generations of trauma and violence that's been inflicted on Palestinians um, and, and, you know, the survivors of the Nakba and their descendants like myself. I am so sorry for what your family has endured. And I just want to say how grateful I am to you for revisiting that history so that others can better learn and understand. And I hope that people will honor that gift and opportunity by taking what you're saying here today to heart. You also wrote that the Nakba is ongoing, as evidenced by the evictions, mob violence, and bombings we're currently witnessing. Can you tell us a bit about how the violence of the Nakba has continued in the decades after Israel declared itself a nation state? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I think this is such an important point for Palestinians that the Nakba never ended. Uh, we, we think about it traditionally as being 47 and 48, but in reality, it's ongoing. Um, so even, you know, looking to immediately afterwards in the 1950s, the, the new Zionist state created several citizenship laws that told Jewish people from around the world that they could settle in Palestine and that, that the new Israeli state would make room for them. And what that means is that they would dispossess Palestinian families um, so, you know, again, trying to debunk this myth of, of uh, a land without people, we were there, you know, and then looking to the, the 1960s, there was the, the next uh, or, or defeat or setback. And that, that was when, you know, all of historic Palestine uh, came under Israeli occupation. So in 47 and 48, a large part of historic Palestine became, you know, occupied, but then in, in 67, all of, of historic Palestine, as we see now, came under Israeli occupation. And in, in the Nakba, uh, 300,000 Palestinians were dispossessed. And about half of them, that was the second time they had become refugees. So those were survivors of the Nakba, who then became survivors of the Nakba as well. And, you know, in, in the ensuing decades, from then until now, we've seen a whole array of apartheid laws depriving Palestinians, even Palestinian citizens of Israel, I think that's important to note, the same protection as Jewish Israelis. So there's, you know, there's separated school systems, segregated sports leagues, separate benefits to people who serve in the occupation forces versus not. And then, you know, in the, the uh, military occupation in the West Bank, there's ongoing destruction of Palestinian villages, ongoing demolition of Palestinian homes, ongoing incarceration of Palestinian children, you know, these policies are designed to, to break our bones, uh, destroy our homes and, and our spirits. And, you know, fortunately, the, the, the last part has not been successful yet. But it's, it's important to note, like, the, the sheer totality of this ongoing ethnic cleansing and violence. And, you know, when we, we think about, like, the, the laws and the project of the Israeli state, I think it's really important to know, obviously, you know, that, that Zionism is a political movement entirely separate from the existence of the Jewish faith and Jewish people, uh, it's also important to understand that Zionism seeks to maintain Jewish supremacy within the Zionist ethnostate of Israel. And so that's, you know, I, I think that that is a, a difficult but important piece to, to really hold because that's why the Nakba is ongoing, because demographic control is actually central to the settler colonial project of Zionism. And, you know, this is why Palestinian refugees cannot return. It's, it's the uh, maintenance of this supremacy system. That's why we're now some 8 million refugees globally. Um, my grandmother is, is obviously older than the state of Israel, and yet she can't return to the home that she was born in. Uh, you know, for me, th this is how the Nakba continues. The Gaza Strip 
is often referred to as an open-air prison, but I think a lot of people don't fully conceptualize what that means. Can you say a bit about the conditions that are imposed upon people in Gaza? Yeah, so so Gaza, I mean, I do think that the description of an open-air prison is, is accurate. Gaza has been under Israeli siege. Israel has besieged Gaza for uh, decades now. And so what that means is that Israel actually controls everything that goes in and out of Gaza. And that means that a lot of basic sort of humanitarian supplies are actually uh, unable to pass in to the region. And Gaza also has one of the highest unemployment rates because people have, I mean, absolutely no mobility. Uh, you know, returning to Gaza as someone who who has left, like there's there's very little permeability across the border between Gaza and you know 48 Palestine or now the, the state of Israel. So that this all contributes to kind of the um, the spiraling of conditions in Gaza that have led to severe unemployment and poverty, food scarcity, uh, you know, all all of these things. Uh, and this is a very small and densely populated area. So, you know, particularly when we see the bombardments of Gaza, that's, you know, so important to understand because Israel likes to tout that they they warn Gazans when, when they're going to bomb them. But this is, you know, like I said, these borders are not permeable. So there's no place for people to go when, when that happens. For our listeners who aren't really familiar with the geography, which I think, if we're honest, is probably most people in the U.S. Gaza is a 140-square-mile strip of coastal land along the Israeli border with Egypt. So it's about the size of Detroit. But Gaza is home to about 2 million people, whereas Detroit is home to about 670,000 people. So Gaza is the third most densely populated urban area in the world. So as Leah mentioned, Israeli officials like to pat themselves on the back about the fact that they warn people that bombs are coming when they attack Gaza. But we're talking about a place where there's nowhere to go and people aren't allowed to leave. In 2012, the United Nations warned that the Gaza Strip might not be a livable place by 2020 due to clean water shortages, crumbling infrastructure, power disruptions, shortages in medical supplies, and rampant poverty. And those were conditions that were being imposed on people even before the mass bombings of 2014, when Israel waged massive attacks on Gazan infrastructure, targeting hospitals and schools and residential areas and the area's only power plant. And now in 2021, after a year of having their situation further compromised by COVID-19, which has had a devastating impact on Gaza, they are being bombed again. And I also think it's worth noting in this densely populated area where there are so few places to go, warning people that you are going to bomb their homes isn't really merciful if you also bomb the bomb shelters, which is something else that Israel has historically done. Israel claims that it does not occupy Gaza and characterizes Gaza as a foreign enemy because it withdrew Israeli troops and settlers back in 2005. But Israel maintains external control over Gaza and indirect control over life within Gaza. Israel controls Gazan airspace and all but one of Gaza's land crossings. And the Israeli military enters and patrols Gaza at will, committing violence at their discretion. And very importantly, Gaza is dependent on Israel for its water, electricity, and other utilities. So with a blockade preventing Gaza from developing and maintaining its own infrastructure, or even supplying its own hospitals, and total control over things like electricity, we aren't talking about two countries on equal footing locked into some kind of continuous rivalry, as is often portrayed. Gaza came under Israeli control in 1967, following the Six-Day War with Arab states. And while some efforts were made to create Israeli settlements, I think Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin represented the opinion of many Israelis in 1992 when he said, quote, I would like Gaza to sink into the sea, but that won't happen, and a solution must be found, end quote. So that solution has taken the form of these periodic bombardments and attacks, 
that Israeli leaders characterize as mowing the grass, that devastate infrastructure and take years to repair, never really allowing the Palestinian people to create any kind of stability. Israeli authorities often cite the existence of underground tunnels that they say are being used by Hamas to move weaponry and personnel as being the real targets of their air raids. But the specter of these tunnels really creates a sort of phantom target that allows Israel to bomb whatever it wants, no matter how inhumane, and just blame Hamas for supposedly putting a tunnel or an office near that target. When in reality, inflicting widespread punishment and damage to infrastructure as a form of deterrence is just consistent with Israel's longstanding military practices. Tunnels also exist for the purpose of smuggling necessities into Gaza, given that the area is blockaded and people aren't allowed to access essential goods and materials. So we're also talking about Israel creating a need for covert transport and then using the existence of covert tunnels as grounds for bombing. I was trying to explain a bit of this history to a young friend of mine this week, and she said, they don't really teach us about any of that in school. And I had to explain that I actually was taught about Israel and Palestine in school, but that the narrative that was presented to us was full of lies and distortions, which of course is really common in the U.S. I remember distinctly being in junior high and being taught that Israel was a project designed to save Jewish people after the Holocaust. And then the story just sort of leapt forward in time to the present, to there being terrorists who claimed that Israel was actually their land, and that those terrorists would instigate attacks on their own communities, using women and children as human shields so that they could demonize Israel. I had no clue until I was an adult that Israel had committed massacres or mass dispossession or waged war in violation of international law. I think that's really common, but I also think a lot of people in the U.S. encounter that information, if they do encounter it, very defensively. Jewish people, of course, are often taught to idealize Israel, but even non-Jewish people in the U.S. are taught to idealize the United States, and pointing the finger at Israel for its crimes also implicates the United States, both in terms of our active support of Israeli violence but also in terms of reconciling native genocide and chattel slavery and Jim Crow. The U.S. has a long tradition of twisting its own history of colonial violence into a narrative of innocence, discovery, and exceptionalism. As a native person, I am very cognizant of the parallels between the violence the U.S. has inflicted on native peoples and the violence Israel has inflicted upon the Palestinian people, But I think most Americans are averse to any reckoning with those parallels or with the history or present day realities of colonialism in the U.S. because they don't want to confront what that moral conversation might demand of them. Do you think people in the U.S. are afraid of confronting what's happening in Gaza because doing so would undermine their own mythologies? Absolutely. I think unlearning and deprogramming these mythologies is one of the hardest things to overcome here in the U.S. And, you know, I I will say I resonated a lot with what you were saying as a Palestinian American growing up in the U.S. public education system was, I mean, frankly, was an absolute mindfuck. It really screwed with me. Uh, We had independent groups come to our classrooms when, when I was, a you know, a primary school student to teach us about how great Israel was. And, you know, I was actively being taught propaganda uh, in schools that was in direct contrast with my own existence and history. I have a very clear memory of being in a world history classroom in high school and being shown a video about Israel, Palestine that, that, you know, really played into these normalizing myths about, you know, an equivocal or, you know, an equal balance between Palestine and Israel. And uh, it was, it was just like properly disinformation about about Palestine. And even within that framework of normalization, I remember quite clearly when they profiled or, or, you know, had a portrait of a a Palestinian family living in the West Bank, a a student who was sitting next to me was like, yeah, like we don't like them because they're against us. (laughs) And this was something that the teacher, you know, didn't intervene, totally allowed. Actually, I remember nodding along. And, you know, this is what it's like to be a Palestinian uh, 
growing up in the U.S. education system is, is being taught things that, that just contradict with our understanding of, of our own families. Uh, and, you know, the, the human shield myth, like you, you were talking about, is, is also, I think, one of the most insidious ones because it's this, you know, active uh, attempt to twist history and rewrite it as it's happening to make Palestinians responsible for our own deaths. There's, you know, th this talking point that um, that Zionists will tell you over and over again that the destruction that we've seen in Gaza is the result actually of Palestinians themselves because they they have been put in the line of fire by other Palestinians. Um, and, and this is obviously a, a lie, but it's it's not that unusual in the U.S. education system when there's similar racist myths that are perpetuated here in the U.S. about Native people and Black people. Um, you know, I think on the one hand, we talk about progressive except Palestine is, is a phrase that describes the denial of Palestinian humanity among, you know, otherwise, quote unquote, staunch progressives. But on the other hand, you know, for me, I kind of feel like how can we expect the U.S. state to acknowledge their direct funding of ethnic cleansing of Palestine when U.S. settlers haven't reckoned with their own legacy of genocide and ethnic cleansing of Native peoples. And to me, this is why it's so important that we're, we're learning about each other's histories and deprogramming together, but it's really hard. And, you know, I, I'm definitely curious about, uh, as you mentioned, sort of experiencing or seeing, seeing some parallels with your experience as, as a Native person here in the U.S. And, and I'm curious if any of this resonates with you, too. Absolutely. I completely identify with what you were saying about being confronted with misinformation in school. And even when a bit of reality would break through, watching it get glossed over or dismissed. I remember being in class once in like the fifth or sixth grade when we talked about a massacre of Native people. And the conversation just sort of moved on without any acknowledgement of it having been wrong. And I spoke up and said, and we all understand that was wrong, right? And a classmate said, yeah, nobody cares. And just like with your situation, the teacher said nothing. And then later in high school, when we were about to talk about some of the realities of Native genocide, the sort of very limited whitewashed version of that history that sometimes makes its way into curriculums in some cities and states here, we got a 20-minute speech from our teacher about how you can't judge the people of the past by today's standards, and he refused to call on me when I had my hand up for, like, the entirety of the speech, because I was, of course, going to point out that my people were also the people of the past, and we knew it was wrong to slaughter and displace us back then. But there's this sort of colonial mentality that you can't judge someone for hurting other people if they didn't think they were wrong to do it which is just beyond absurd because people are constantly rationalizing their harms, whether alone or in large groups. And of course, we should be judging and also learning. And those rationalizations and that sort of programming, as you described, they are reinvented and reformulated over time as mechanisms of harm shift. So sometimes a country might admit, like the U.S. occasionally does about some things, that it made mistakes a long time ago. But everything it does now is justified. I also think it's very significant that both the United States and Israel sort of rely on these early narrative justifications of victimhood, of people fleeing oppression as jumping off points. Because narratively, as the colonizer, if you were previously the target of violence and severe oppression, then you are justified in doing whatever you feel you have to do to make sure you have a place in the world. Whereas that notion of previous harms justifying violence is never applied to the people being colonized, occupied, or oppressed, as we see with the Palestinian people who have been robbed, murdered, and abused for over 70 years, and with Black people in the United States who are routinely chastised for any form of disruptive protest. In these colonial narratives that were fed, any acts of violent or destructive resistance on the part of the people being colonized is always cited as evidence that overwhelming violence against them was actually necessary. And when we look at these legacies of colonial militarism, we can see how it all intertwines and compounds over time in practice. U.S. soldiers today refer to being in enemy territory as being in-country 
which is derived from the phrase Indian country. They have missiles they call tomahawks, and of course, U.S. Apache helicopters that are now used by the Israeli government against Palestinian people. We know that some of the same weapons are unleashed on protesters here and in Palestine and in many other places. The Red Nation podcast actually had an excellent episode recently about some of the parallels that I think everyone should check out. One of the important distinctions that they highlighted was that the U.S. government's objective where Native people are concerned has been assimilationist for some time now. The process of annihilation has given way to assimilation and co-optation and sort of a rewriting of our role in history. We have right-wing forces in this country that are seeking to disenfranchise us by attacking Native voting rights. But the larger anti-Native project is one of assimilation at this stage of U.S. colonialism. Whereas Israeli leaders who want an Israeli ethnostate are threatened by Arab and Palestinian people, in part because of the rising population of Arab and Palestinian people in Israel that makes apartheid and the absence of democracy the only way for that sort of ethno-dominance to continue. So while we aren't talking about that same kind of siege and apartheid here in the U.S. at this moment in our history, I do feel strong historical ties between these histories of dispossession, concentration, and annihilation, and the present-day right-wing attitude in the U.S. toward the rising majority of non-white people. Because rising numbers of Black people, Latinx people, and other people of color have a lot of racist white people terrified because they recognize that if they want to maintain white domination, free and fair elections simply aren't an option for them. So they are desperate to institute these anti-voting laws and anti-protest laws. Yes, yeah, I really, you know, I resonate so much with that. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to listening to that podcast. I, I think, um, to me, a lot of it comes down to these projects of supremacy. And then you spoke a lot about you know, the, the demographic threat that in, in the U.S. non-white people pose to white supremacy and in Palestine that non-Jewish Palestinians pose to Jewish supremacy within, within the Zionist state. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, deprogram all of these institutions that have been built up to maintain those, those levels of supremacy. I mean, I, I can remember an instance where I was talking to a neighbor when, when I was a child who literally, you know, I, I was, it was, I was trying to explain um, some of the, the context in Palestine and, and the brutality of the Israeli military. And this person literally put their hands over their ears and said out loud to me, I, I don't want to hear this. I can't hear this. And I think, oh my God. <laughs> I think this speaks to the, the level of indoctrination that, that has been quite successful and, and, you know, really it it speaks to the strength of these institutions that have been built to maintain supremacy. I mean, like systems of policing, incarceration, racial domination are inherent to the states and institutions that we live in, in the U.S., also in, in Israel. And it's really quite difficult to extract, you know, those, those myths um, about the necessity of those things like policing, incarceration, racial domination from our sense of order and justice. You know, I think decoupling those things when particularly for folks who benefit from the systems of supremacy, you know, have been indoctrinated in them. It's really hard, but it's it's necessary and it's, it's urgent. Absolutely. I, I want to talk a bit about international law and also about the limitations of framing atrocities within the context of international law. Israel is widely known for flaunting international human rights laws in terms of failing to distinguish between combatants and civilians, and in terms of the proportionality and necessity of their attacks. With regard to the humane treatment of civilians and imprisoned Palestinians, of course, Attacks on civilians, disproportionate violence, torture, and assassinations were hardly pioneered by Israel. But Israel has adopted a PR policy of attempting to legitimize these actions in ways that have had broader impacts. Daniel Reisner, who headed Israel's International Law Division of the Military Advocate General's Unit until 2005, has said of Israel's tactics, 
quote, what we are seeing now is a revision of international law. If you do something for long enough, the world will accept it. The whole international law is now based on the notion that an act that is forbidden today becomes permissible if executed by enough countries. International law progresses through violations. We invented the targeted assassination thesis, and we had to push it. At first, there were protrusions that made it hard to insert easily into the legal molds. Eight years later, it is in the center of the bounds of legitimacy, end quote. So Israel pushed targeted assassinations as being legally valid and collateral damage in such attacks as being acceptable. Subsequently, we have seen other countries, including the U.S., who previously might have enacted such measures covertly, seek to legitimize such killings. Generally speaking, the most powerful countries in the world have never submitted themselves to the strictures of international law. But I think there's something noteworthy about the way that that process of proliferation, of moving the line by making the violation the norm and insisting it makes sense. We have also seen this domestically in the U.S. in terms of how police violence operates, which to me suggests that the law itself, while important and something we should talk about, is not the moral line in the sand we would like it to be. It's a very flexible line, and it is shaped by violation. I warn people about this in the U.S. with regard to policing all the time now, because we're seeing the emergence of these anti-protest laws, and people who live in democratic states tend to think that they won't be subject to those laws. But police and military forces are not instruments of the law. They wield the law when it suits them, but they are not inhibited by it. They wield the law like they wield their weapons at their discretion to maintain the order of things. And the more normalized something becomes, the more likely people are to accept it as part of that order. So the cops break the law or a colonial violence unfolds in Palestine and we say, but that's against the law. And people say, well, you know that if you do X, then Y is going to happen. The institutional infraction just becomes part of the order of things, and people accept the order of things until something inspires them to reject it. Another problem with relying so heavily on the law is that it positions morality within the bounds of the law. And while colonized and occupied people do have the right under international law to resist, they also have a fundamental right to resist, regardless of anything that's been codified by legal or legislative bodies. Law has frequently been on the wrong side of morality, and when it's on the right side, it rarely applies to the powerful in practice. I, I think we need to know the law and to talk about the law, but I think we need to appeal to something more fundamental in our struggles. I have to say I love this analysis because I think it's really important to talk about explicitly the limitations of structures of law and legality. What, you know, what this comes down to in my mind is kind of the omnipresence of neoliberalism and its tight grip on our framing of justice, because I think, you know, and, and I look at Palestinian society, for example, after the Oslo Accords, which were the, the peace deals that happened in the 1990s, we saw a really detrimental shift in international discourse about Palestine that really framed everything in terms of the rights of the individual, you know, everything centering the individual and the ascendance of the state as the ultimate goal of the Palestinian people. And this is where we get this course about, you know, one state, two state solution, building a Palestinian state over a Palestinian people. Um, and, you know, we also saw, you know, out of this, out of this period, like this rampant escalation of human rights discourse. So, you know, Palestinians just want their human rights there, you know, and that's, that's true, but like, I, I want my existence and liberation to be valid, whether or not the UN agrees with me. So I think what this framing can deprive us of is an understanding of collectivism and an understanding of liberation. Um, and yes, absolutely. It can be helpful to talk about human rights violations and how Israel does violate international law because they do egregiously violate international law. However, you know, international law is not a moral compass. Um, and, you know, that's, that's exactly what, I, what I'm hearing from, from you as well. In fact, to the contrary, a lot of these legal systems, as you pointed out, are actually designed by imperialists and supremacists. 
so, you know, I, I think Mohammed El Kurd, who's one of the home defenders in Sheikh Jarrah, said, said this really well that, you know, he said, I do not derive my moral compass from the US on, on an interview the other day. And that's so powerful because part of US hegemony or, or you know, in, in the Palestinian context, part of Zionist hegemony is the idea that legality as determined by colonizers and imperialists is morality. And that's simply not the case. You know, as you as you alluded to, laws can be designed to create restoration and justice, but laws can be designed to enforce racial hierarchy. They can be, like you said, wielded by by law enforcement and military to uh, reinforce oppression. And when the, when that's the case, laws serve actually to actually, in fact, gaslight the oppressed population by saying that you know we deserve what we got because you know in some cases we broke the law, or like you said, if if Y happens, expect Z. Um, for example, like you live in Gaza, that's it's it's almost expected that you know violence will be subjugated upon the Palestinians there, and that's that's acceptable under this framework. Um, and I think, you know, what we really need to ask ourselves in these moments uh, and in our movements for liberation are questions about people's well-being, justice, and liberation, and like how do we want people to live? What do we want to build together? Um, and Palestinians. Yes, we are just asking for basic freedoms and dignities, but we deserve them whether or not we legally have a right to them, you know, particularly when law is dictated by our oppressors. And so in this framework, another thing that I'll just say is that, like, ironically, the state is personified and ascended, but people are dehumanized. And that's where we get this discourse about, you know, Israel has a right to exist, but the Palestinian people don't. And to me, that's what's, you know, the, the extreme... Um, extent to where that the framework of law and legality can become problematic, where, where a state has more of a right to existence than a people do. And when we're talking about the law and grounding morality in the law, I, I think we really need to look at these claims of self-defense, because that's something we're hearing a lot from people. This morning, someone on social media said, okay, but how much violence is Israel supposed to endure before they respond? And the vagueness of that concept of a response was just too much for me. So what I said to them was, well, if you hurt me and I hurt you back, a lot of people would be understanding of there being some retaliation on my part. Whereas if you hurt me and then I blew up the block you live on, people might be less understanding of that. And if you hurt me because I have controlled the entire context in which you live, dominating you, killing and imprisoning your family, restricting your rights and making your life miserable, and you lashed out, and I reacted by blowing up the block you live on, then I hope that would generate a different reaction than if we were just talking about two people who hit one another. I think we need to be incredibly critical of this concept of self-defense when it's deployed by countries with powerful militaries, and that we need to question who has access to that concept. Like here in the United States, Miriam Kaba has written about how black women are treated as though they have no selves to defend. Marissa Alexander wasn't allowed to invoke the stand your ground law, even though she only fired a warning shot in self-defense. Palestinians are attacked while praying. They're evicted from their homes by state sanctioned mobs and they're being slaughtered. The idea of self-defense is not on the table for them. Meanwhile, Israel can destroy as many residential buildings as it wants, and no matter how disproportionate the response, they will call it self-defense, and the U.S. will defend that thematically, because the U.S. relies on those kinds of themes and lies as well, domestically and abroad. The U.S. fought a whole war with Iraq over a threat that they didn't actually pose. And I also really want to emphasize for folks the way that these colonial entities borrow and build off of each other's violence. In 2002, during Israel's Operation Defensive Shield, Israel deployed armored bulldozers that flattened everything in their path, and the U.S. ultimately criticized the severity of Israel's actions during that offensive. But a year later, the U.S. actually purchased some of those armored bulldozers from Israel and then deployed them during urban operations in Iraq. So I think it's important to understand how colonial and imperial violence cooperates and compounds over time, regardless of whatever lip service is briefly paid to human rights. 
because we're talking about fundamentally violent constructs that operate in concert with one another and rely on one another. So I think we need to shut down claims of self-defense anytime we're looking at this kind of disparity of power. And anytime those words are only accessible to the side with more power. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I, I see the, the seeds of this happening. I think we're at a point where people are beginning to understand uh, the colonial nature of the Israeli state. And that speaks to sort of like your third example. If I, if I control your house and your family and your neighborhood and completely dominate everything about your existence, and you respond, you know, that, that's closer to a characterization of colonialism than what we traditionally see in U.S. media. So I think I've seen in informal channels that conversation happening more and more. But I, I really think, you know, it, what, what you're talking about is so important because we really can't answer sort of these questions of like who is entitled to self-defense, who has a self to defend. I mean, dehumanization being so central to that concept, because, you know, I mean, to, to our earlier conversation, the goal of a supremacist state is to have a monopoly on the legitimacy of violence. And that's what the U.S., um, both, both in domestic domination and in imperialist, uh, you know, conquests, and also the Zionist state have, have very effectively done, is have a monopoly on the legitimacy of violence. And so I think we need to really have a, a deprogramming of what how how a lot of people in the U.S. understand violence to occur and what actually is violence, um, you know, what it constitutes. I think under this framework where colonial states have a monopoly on violence, that's how you get headlines like Palestinians die, Israelis killed. I mean, there was just the other day I saw a headline that was like, you know, 20 Palestinians die, you know, three Israelis killed. It's like, okay, like let's, let's, let's address this framework and, and talk about what's going on here. Because, uh, you know, as you, as you sort of alluded to, I mean, oppressed peoples, in this case, Palestinians will always be demonized for our resistance. And our resistance will actually always be called violence, even if no physical human beings are actually being harmed. And I think, you know, the characterizations of, for example, the boycott, divestment and sanction movements sort of clarifies how that can happen. But that really, you know, forces us to ask this question about like, what is violence, you know? Um, and, and in the Palestinian context, Israel has one of the largest, the world's largest and most well-financed military bankrolled by, you know, of course, that $3.8 billion of U.S. tax money a year. And when we, when we ask ourselves, what is violence? You know, I'd highlight that life expectancy in Israel is 10 years higher than it is in the West Bank and Gaza infant mortality rate in Gaza is more than five times higher than it is in Israel and, you know, several times higher than it is in the U.S. Palestinians, and obviously within the U.S., there's there's massive disparities in those numbers as well when we look at racial breakdowns. And, you know, to me, this, this characterization is essential because all of these things are forms of violence. And Palestinians in every corner of historic Palestine are facing violent dispossession. And so the reality is that the state of of Israel does not want Palestinians to live. Like that that is the core uh, violence, you know? Population control and demographic supremacy is literally baked into the idea of Zionism as with any ethno state. And it's written into the laws of the country as we talked about earlier. So, you know, this totality and absolute omnipresence of violence in Palestine is what Palestinian people are up against. And I think once people understand that, we can begin to dissolve this racist weaponization of terms like self-defense. We have been programmed pretty hard here in the States and in many places to believe that only peaceful actions are acceptable on the part of oppressed people. Part of that is the way that history gets rewritten to depict nonviolent tactics as being the only successful or effective tactics and violent action as always counterproductive or even as derailing the momentum of nonviolent action. That not only erases the role that violent or destructive action has played, whether people like it or not, in the propulsion of social change, it also plays into false narratives of symmetry, which leads to words like 
clashes being deployed to describe U.S. police or Israeli forces enacting crushing violence against the people they oppress. For a brief moment last year, I saw some potential in the U.S. for us to overcome this hang-up when a police station burned to the ground and public support for protesters remained high. Ultimately, people's fear of Trump being re-elected shifted liberals back towards the status quo. But we are seeing a lot of activation in this moment. Do you think we are at a point of potential in terms of more people recognizing that Palestinians have a right to pursue a diversity of tactics? That's a great question, and it's a hard question. Um, I think I do see potential in that, you know, I see that intervention happening in conversations. And I think to a lot of credit of the uprising this, you know, in the this, this summer of 2020, uh, like you referenced, that that really helped a lot of folks reframe or deprogram or, or understand these mythologies about peaceful protest being the only form of legitimate resistance. And so I, I do see a lot of potential for some of that nuanced understanding of, of the context of colonialization, of supremacy, et cetera, to inform how people are thinking about Palestine. Uh, but, you know, as any Palestinian, I'm, I'm quite cautiously optimistic about that because I think, you know, I, I think there's just such a lack of context that particularly U.S. media narratives have around Palestine. I, I still see um, so many of those false equivalences of uh, quote unquote Palestinian violence and Israeli violence. I mean, it's just journalistic malpractice, in my opinion, to, to present things that way. So, you know, being that I still see that that narrative sort of like transcending the, the noise and perhaps productive conversations that people are having in their homes and on social media, I'm, I'm cautious. But I do think I do think that there's, you know, a reframing and a shifting that's happening, you know, in, in many circles within the U.S. And so, something that, you know, I said earlier is when I really urge, you know, non-Palestinians and particularly white folks to, to sort of come to the lens of, of something that Palestinian people are saying with an understanding or, or asking themselves the question, if, if a Palestinian says something that you think you disagree with, think about, you know, really sit, sit down and think about if you had endured 73 years of brutal colonization, uh, brutal racial oppression, you know, and, and ongoing ethnic cleansing, could you see yourself or someone you love saying that thing you think you disagree with? And, and you know, I think that context and like basic kind of uh, mental exercise, if, if, if we keep doing it, then I think maybe there will be like a more nuanced understanding of how, like you said, social change happens and how a, a diversity of tactics um, a, and a range of, of resistance, you know, is, is really how any decolonization that's ever happened has happened. Um, any, any move towards liberation, towards uh, legitimate justice and resistance has, you know, it, it's always taken many forms. And so again, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, that we can begin having those difficult conversations more and more in the U.S., but cautious being the operative word. <laughs> I hear that. So one question I have heard from a lot of people is why there can't be a two-state solution to this crisis. The whole idea to me about how do we accommodate people who are insisting on an ethno-state is kind of troubling, but the idea of a two-state solution really is sort of a liberal PR dodge at this point, isn't it? Totally. I mean, you know, this this makes me think about when I got back from Palestine a few years ago, the absurdity of this conversation about, you know, the two state solution for me was so stark, particularly having just come from the situation on the ground in Palestine, um, because it, it felt so removed from any Palestinian that I had talked to, you know, their understanding um, or my understanding as a Palestinian American of, of what liberation looked like. Um, it didn't fit into that two-state solution mold. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, like this ascendance of statehood being the goal is really something that, uh, at least, you know, in, in narratives about 
Palestinian resistance came out of the Oslo Accords. And to me, it's like, it's so laughable because, you know, what's, what's the point of a state without freedom? Like, why are we ever okay with the existence of a society predicated on maintaining the supremacy of one religious or ethnic group over all others? Like, that's, that's unacceptable in any context. That's not what liberation is. And, you know, this discourse is really part of a multi-billion dollar theater of, you know, of academia, of diplomacy, you know, of, of political figureheads talking about, you know, the nonsense of, of uh, sketching out what Palestinian statehood would look like in the future. Because, you know, this, like I said, this multi-billion dollar theater really aims to obfuscate what's actually happening in Palestine. So to me, I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a, it's a PR dodge. It's not a, a genuine, you know, consideration of, of what's actually happening and what liberation means for Palestinians. And with Israel, over a period of years, forcibly evicting and stealing massive tracts of homes and land to create as much incongruity between Palestinian communities as possible, I think it's important for people to understand that two states has never been the goal from the Israeli government's perspective. Making that impossible by way of mass dispossession has been a key part of their strategy for decades. So while liberals in the U.S. have talked about a two-state solution for years, Israel has gone about the work of making that totally unfeasible, even if it were being discussed in good faith or what anyone actually wanted. So all of that said, What should people in the U.S. who are outraged about these bombings and about the apartheid conditions Palestinians are faced with do if they want to help? So, you know, there's there's a couple things that I would encourage folks to to do if if they're feeling you know inspired to to act in solidarity with Palestinians. The first, uh, you know, perhaps obviously is the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. So that's a movement that came um, out of a, a grouping of, of Palestinian civil society um, in 2005, and that calls upon uh, folks in the international community to, you know, as, as the name suggests, boycott uh, companies and goods that profit off of Israeli oppression of Palestinians, to divest from companies that are, again, profiting off of ethnic cleansing. And then finally, um, at the, the government level, for states to sanction Israel for their war crimes. And so, you know, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, I think, is a really good place. It's a good foray into Palestinian, the Palestinian liberation and Palestinian solidarity movement for folks. You know, it's, I think their website is bdsmovement.net. Um, and, and I do think that's a good place to start. It's a good place to begin having conversations that can confront Israeli mythology and, and confront Zionism in our own communities. Um, I think BDS is a great way to, to begin doing that. And obviously it takes from the legacy of, you know, black liberation fighters in South Africa. And also here in the U S we can think of, you know, the Montgomery bus boycott in the U S the Polaroid boycott in South Africa. So it's, it's, you know, coming from that legacy. Uh, and, and again, I think it's a really great place to start. I would also say that, you know, for me as a Palestinian, particularly thinking about everything we've been, you know, talking about today, what I'd really urge people to do is to, struggle with, you know, their perhaps friends and family members to deprogram these Zionist narratives and to make an intervention the next time, you know, they hear someone talk about how complicated the conflict is, how they just couldn't take a stand because it's, it's all too complex. You know, the next time someone regurgitates these myths about uh, Palestinian terrorism or, you know, any of these things that we've sort of talked about today, I, I think it's really important and it can often be the harder work to talk to someone you love or admire and, and do this deprogramming with them and, and make that intervention. Um, it's really hard, but I think it's perhaps the most urgent piece of moving the, the conversation on Palestine forward here in the U.S. The last thing I would just say, I guess, is you know, if there's any Palestinians who, who listen to this, I would say, like, you know, take care of yourself. I, I just actually got off the phone with, with my grandmother before we had this conversation. And um, we, were, we were talking about Nekva Day. And uh, she very sweetly said, you know, don't be too sad. Look to the future. You know, try to find the good in things. Like right now, for example, I'm making fed at homeless and taking it to your uncle's house. So I just like, I, I, that was a real grounding moment for me. And, and I wanted to share in case there are, are folks who are Palestinian and, and listening in. Well, thank you. 
so much for sharing that. I think my heart needed to hear that too. If folks want to learn more from you and connect with your work, where can they find you? Sure. Um, I think, you know, you can find me on Twitter at Leah K. Alley, um, L-E-A-K-A-Y-A-L-I. And uh, you can also follow BDS Boston, um, which is one of the groups I'm a part of, and also the Palestinian Youth Movement, which is another group I organize with. And I would, you know, highly recommend folks to, to follow the BDS movement, particularly if you live in Boston, to follow BDS Boston and to follow the Palestinian Youth Movement, which is a nationwide, you know, movement of, of you know, the younger generation of Palestinians who are hoping to, to push our liberation movement forward. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us today, Leah. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Kelly. This has been incredible. I also want to thank our listeners for joining us today. And remember, our best defense against cynicism is to do good and to remember that the good we do matters. Until next time, I'll see you in the streets. Thank you for listening to Movement Memos. This show wouldn't exist if it weren't for Truthout, and Truthout's independent news and commentary wouldn't exist without listeners and readers like you. We have no paywalls, no corporate sponsors, and no ads, except for fundraising appeals like this one. So if you can and would like to support our work, please consider dropping by truthout.org to make a donation today.